You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Greetings, and welcome to As Read By Me, episode 106. I'm Dave Stiles, and somehow it's almost Thanksgiving. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank you, the listeners, for your support of this podcast. The response we've received so far is amazing and much appreciated. And you know, it's one thing to have a theory that steadily bringing in new writers will bring in new listeners, which will bring in new writers, etc. But it's another thing to actually see it working. Our listeners are recommending writers, and those writers are bringing in new listeners. And in general, the cross-pollination of our writers and listeners is working exactly as we'd hoped. And for that, we are truly grateful. None of this happens without you. In fact, without you, I'm just a guy talking to himself in a closet. So, my sincere thanks in lending us your earballs once again for another episode. And hey, if you like it, consider giving us a donation. You can find donation links in the episode description or by going to asreadbyme.com and clicking on the donate button. First up this week is the man without whom this podcast wouldn't exist, Peter Waits, with his short story, Getting Screwed. Then Paul Camerata reads his poem about a group of industrious kids entitled The Lemonade Link. And finally, former Philly sportscaster Don Tollefson reads his essay on Collapsing Common Sense. Here we go. Enjoy the show. Hello, I'm Peter Waits, and this is Getting Screwed, as read by me. In 1955, my parents bought their first brand-new car, a green six-cylinder standard shift Chevrolet station wagon. This was the first car I legally drove after I got my driver's license. I say legally drove because my father taught me how to drive at an early age, long before I was 16, so I had already been driving for a couple of years. Also, after I got my license, on the left side of the rear bumper of that car, I spelled out my name with bright red reflective tape. And on the right side of the bumper, I spelled out you-know-who's name. At that time, around the corner from where we lived, my parents had a neighborhood store, the Fruit Bowl. Before my father got a walk-in cooler to store the inventory, all he had was a small ice chest in the back room. So nightly trips to the produce market, which in those days was around Faneuil Hall, were a necessity. He'd leave our apartment at 30 Evelyn Street around 2 o'clock in the morning, walk around the corner to the store on Blue Hill Avenue to get the truck, drive to the market, make his purchases, and then drive back to the store. He'd get there around 6 o'clock, at which time the truck had to be emptied and the shelves stocked so the store could open at 8 o'clock. This was a family business. We all worked there, my brother and I and our mother. Both of our parents worked very hard and put in long, long hours. During busy times, you know who worked there, too. In 1955, in addition to my parents' car, my brother had a Chevrolet hardtop convertible, and the truck was a Chevrolet, too. Chevrolet was built by General Motors, and back then, the key used to start any GM vehicle had a good probability to be able to start any other GM vehicle, too. I have no idea if it's accurate, but I was told GM only used seven keys for all of their vehicles. So with three GM vehicles and thus three GM car keys at our disposal, the probability to start any other GM car was an odds-on favorite. If any of the GM cars were parked in front of the store and in our way, and if it was there for more than a few minutes, I, with three GM keys available for my use, I would get in the car and drive it around the corner. I don't ever recall not being able to move a GM car. Even before I got my driver's license, I got lots and lots of practice learning how to get in and out of tight parking spots. Those easy-to-replace car keys no longer exist. Back then, for any of those vehicles to have an extra key made cost about 50 cents. Today's car keys have embedded chips and replacing the car keys now is expensive. Both of the keys to my 2005 Saab have seen better days, and I have no intention of spending about $250 to replace even one of them. Yeah, that's what it now costs to have an extra key made. As for the problems with my Saab keys, 
One of them has its innards exposed, and the other one is held together with scotch tape. And I'm in no mood to spend 250 bucks to replace either of them. And since I have no intention of ever buying another car, these dilapidated relics are going to have to last for a long, long time. I have to put things into perspective. The value of the dollar is not the same now as it was then. But just so you can see how different things are, here are a few examples of how things have changed. If a customer spent at least $2 in our store, we offered free delivery. For elderly customers, and we had a few, there was free delivery for any purchase they made. One of my favorite old-timers was Mr. Klein, who, in the parlance of the day, he was connected. He always had a smile on his face, and he always had stories to tell. He was reputed to be connected because he said he had been a crony of the former mayor of Boston, Mayor Curley. Mayor Curley, it was said, successfully ran for re-election from jail, and he won. Mr. Klein always came into the store with redeemable soda bottles. Some had a redeemed value of two cents and others for a nickel. So we needed to know how to consider his bottles as money. Today's kids would be bewildered to figure out how to account for his bottles and would struggle to make change when he paid for his purchase with dollars, cents, and the bottles. Moving along, for $250 in 1955, you could buy a reasonably good used car. In 1955, a new Chevrolet cost less than $2,000. And I went online recently, and this is what I learned. Today, from Sears, with a lot more electronics than exists in the key to my car, I can buy a 43-inch 4K ultra high-definition television set for $379. I don't know what all that means, but it sounds impressive. But wait, I can do even better at Kmart. There, for less than the cost of a new Saab key, I can buy a 32-inch smart television set for only $179.99. In other words, the few electronics in my car key are far more expensive than the complicated electronics in a multi-purpose television set. As far as I am concerned, I'll be screwed if I buy a new car key, and I ain't going to do it. If the keys stop working, I'll truly be screwed and doing a lot of walking or begging friends and family for a ride. But hey, c'est la vie. Hi, this is Paul Camerata, and this is the Lemonade Link, as read by me. We kids wanted to open a lemonade stand. Smack dab on the corner of Flagstaff and Grand. But when we arrived, supplies all in tow, right there on our spot was a telephone pole. Should we relocate, give up our plan, set up mid-Flagstaff or further down Grand? No way, we kids said. That corner's our goal. So what if they just moved the telephone pole? Could that even happen? Not if we don't ask. We agreed, then proceeded to take on the task. We filled out the forms, began a petition. The Lemonade Kids seek poll reposition. We carried the papers to City Hall. This isn't a thing we've considered at all, said the receptionist, mayor, and clerk. Well, I have, said the bureau chief of Lemon Work. Lemonade was around long before those phone wires, which the need for it, admit it, will quite soon expire. Look to the future. These kids are our link. Invest in their vision. Wireless lemon drink. The receptionist mayor and clerk were dumbfounded, and though trying to hide it, we kids were astounded. Our once barely crawling lemonade stand suddenly had grown legs, sprung up and ran. With a stamp and a seal and a chorus of eyes, our motion was granted right before our eyes. What if became why became how then kapow on the corner of Flagstaff and Grand we sell now. Where that telephone pole did not go to waste after we chopped it into seats for our place. A place people stop to sip a cool drink and to hear the old tale of the lemonade link. Hi, I'm Don Tollefson, and this is Collapsing Common Sense, as read by me. 
Very soon in the history books, we may add the rise and fall of a benchmark of so many successful civilizations, the rise and fall of common sense. It is often subtle and certainly does not have the drama of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, but unchecked, it ultimately may do more harm to more people than the downfall of many civilizations during the history of the world. I'm going to avoid politics in this discussion as much as I can, even though it is home to often the easiest examples to cite when it comes to an almost complete lack of common sense in decision after decision. But rather than risk alienating you and your personal political views, let's show common sense all but disappearing in my beloved world of sports. So the opposing pitcher has just walked in two runs, but he has to stay in the game due to the new three-batter rule. That third batter immediately swings at the first pitch, even though it is about 11 inches above the strike zone. So here we go with the first three-letter response to zero common sense in any situation. A duh. And many times I feel like adding multiple H's with something like duh. In football, you have the late hit and resulting 15-yard personal foul penalty eight yards out of bounds. Or how about the false start by a wide receiver who only has to watch the ball be snapped. You know what? Let the grammar experts complain, but a uh, duh. In basketball, you have the shot with one second left in the game, and your team down by three, and a player shoots from just inside the three-point line. In hockey, it's the almost certain miss at the empty net that forces a face-off right in front of your goalie in the final seconds etc., etc., etc. Let me lob in a, a quick tennis reference there, two non-sports, nonsensical items to be fair to those of you who are not sports fans. And they both involve high-tech passwords. You forget a password and get asked three security questions you may have selected eight years ago. You go two for three, good for the batting average, but you still cannot access your account. You call customer service and offer to provide your social, your last three payment amounts, and the businesses they were paid to. And then you even offer to read the U.S. Constitution to them backwards in Latin, just for the heck of it. And their response is, tough luck, because we are only protecting your account's security. My response is, of course, a duh. Meanwhile, since I cannot access my account, I cannot give them some money. Double duh. And while on the issue of passwords, how about suggested strong passwords like 98BW, capital V, capital S, capital C, 2 capital C, lowercase d, capital N, capital B? Or also the equally easy to remember one of all lowercase C Y D C I K nine W capital Y lowercase V V O. Huh? And then duh. If universities can offer courses like Embracing Distraction as a Way of Knowing, a Belmont University, and Physics for Future Presidents, uh, UC Berkeley. Is it asking too much to add a mandatory course on common sense and maybe even a major? Go team, go. Teach common sense. Thanks for joining us. For more information about the podcast and the authors, visit asreadbyme.com. If you're a writer and would like to read one of your stories on an upcoming episode, send an email to writers at asreadbyme.com. If you like what we're doing and would like to help us remain ad-free, you can support us by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash asreadbyme.